Hi. Uh, now it gives me enormous pleasure to um, introduce the first speaker, Professor Leslie Page. As many of you will know, Leslie is President and a Board Member of the Royal College of Midwives and she began her office just recently in April this year. Uh, she was the first Professor of Midwifery in the UK <coughs> at Thames University, Valley University and Queen Charlotte's Hospital. She's a renowned international academic, advocate and adv activist for midwives, women and babies with more than 32 years experience. Her accomplished career has encompassed practice, management, leadership, academic and policy work and she's practices as a midwife in the community, hospital and home birth settings and continues to practice in Oxfordshire. And many of us um, certainly know Leslie from, from her writing and, and her presentations. Uh, she's also a visiting scholar of midwifery um, at Florence Nightingale School of Nursing and Midwifery King's College London an adjunct professor uh, with UTS in Sydney and a visiting professor at the University of Sydney. Uh, so she has lectured and worked in uh, 13 different countries. Outside academia, she's also an expert advisor to the King's Fund uh, Independent Inquiry into the Safety of Maternity Services in England. Um, and Leslie's had many years working as a senior manager in the NHS. Professor Page is currently on clinical attachment at the Oxford University Hospital's NHS Trust, Coltswood, Coltswold, thank you, <laughs> maternity service, and has more than 37 years experience in the NHS. Uh, so we're, we're thrilled to have Leslie and all that wonderful experience <coughs> and skills that she brings. So welcome Leslie and over to you. Thank you very much Deborah. And I just want to check that everybody can hear me. That's great, thank you. Just let me know if, if you lose me. Well, Deborah, thank you for your kind words of invitation, but I wanted particularly to thank Sarah for inviting me to open this wonderful conference, a virtual conference that's bringing so many of us together. Thank you for all the amazing work you and many others have put into this. It's uniting us into one world and hello to everyone gathered here in our virtual room. I've just started as President of the Royal College of Midwives and this is really my first public speaking engagement. I spoke to the students at King's College, University London, just a small group. Um, but this, I think, is really my entry into my world as president. And many of you will know the Royal College of Midwives um, has about 40,000 members and that every woman in Britain has a midwife and we're slightly different to other parts of the world. I just wanted to tell you a little secret. Sarah Stewart was my advisor in my election campaign. Um, I use social media and I was a very kind of lukewarm user of Facebook and um, LinkedIn and Sarah gave me huge encouragement and support and technical advice so I want to thank her. Thank you also for that wonderful Mari welcome, Jay and Candice, it was very moving. The International Day of the Midwife is a really important one. It was developed in the 1990s by the International Confederation of Midwives to help us inform the world about what midwifery is and how important it is. And this meeting today is symbolic of a world that's getting smaller. It's getting smaller because of our communications, the internet, film, social media, mobile phones and television. I learned the other day that in Africa about 50% of people have a mobile phone. This new technology is the basis of revolutions in the way we think and work and communicate. Just watching the notes about Twitter made me realize how ignorant I am 
and I've just started to use it, but you saw a new language developing, a new way of talking. But it's also the basis of other revolutions, of social revolutions. We all saw in the Arab uprisings that the ability of people to mobilize and have the courage to stand up to the regimes was actually through the use of mobile phones and the internet. But we're also in a world that's very deeply divided. It's divided by different levels of affluence, by war, by poverty, by ethnicity, culture, and religion. And these divisions actually have huge effects on us as midwives. We also, I think, have a tendency to become voyeurs. I watched with distress some of the newscasts from Syria. And it was strange, really, to watch how the camera people could film the catastrophes and the tragedies close by, but we could do nothing to help. And I think that that is one of the things that we need to think about when we're thinking about midwifery around the world. How do we become more than voyeurs, more than people watching what's happening in other parts of the world, and actually get together in solidarity to help each other? There is a huge division in the maternity world. There's one part of the world where there aren't enough skilled carers, there's not enough resources, there's not enough information not enough medical care and intervention, and where too many of women and their babies die or are injured. On the other hand, there's the other world, where there is too much. Too much resource used on interventions, too many interventions. Often, in this other world, there's not enough access to home birth, to community care, to midwife-led non-medical care. And one of my questions is, how might we achieve a balance? The main question for me in thinking about today, in looking at this world where we're all inter interdependent for resources, for our economy, for ecology and peace, is this. Is the kind of midwifery required the same, whether it is in Oxford, where I practice, or for example, Afghanistan? Do we share common ideals, common values, common approaches, common knowledge base? Do we all need to rethink, reaffirm for the world we live in, a world where pace of change is unprecedented, where even in affluent parts of the world, the economic meltdown threatens resources in the health services? Above all, I want to ask the question, how do we use globalization to advantage so that we can work through a global community to help each other. The International Day of the Midwife was developed so that we could inform, celebrate, and motivate. Inform about the work of midwifery, about the importance of midwifery, about achievements and challenges, and this is important wherever we are. Even in parts of the world where midwifery is well embedded in the culture, in the health services and communities we live in, there can be difficulties in our technocratic ways in understanding and practicing to the full extent of our role. There are parts of the world that where there are very few midwives or where the role has been suppressed and confined. But I think that we all have to make sure that we recognize that there's a great deal to celebrate too. First, I want to just take a moment to think about the fundamental part of our role in helping women and their families around the birth of their babies, the start of new life and new family. This makes a tremendous difference to individuals and families and I like to think that every birth will make a difference 
to the world. The phrase that keeps coming into my mind is that we build a better world one birth at a time. We should also celebrate developments in midwifery. ICM itself is a huge achievement and is a powerful force in the world. There is some movement towards the Millennium Development Goal 5, and I understand a reduction in maternal mortality. In many countries, midwifery development, midwifery-led care, birth centers, research, publications about and for midwives flourish. To me, motivation is mainly found in understanding the profound impact of our work. Midwifery makes a huge difference. Not only do midwives save lives, but they also set the woman and her baby and family on the right path to parenting. It's not just physical care, but sensitive, emotional, and psychological support, and enabling that crucial bond or attachment that binds mother, baby, and family together over years. These two ensuring a physically healthy mother and baby, and supporting a strong, confident, competent mother able to fully love and commit her baby are at the base of our work. Above all, emotionally sensitive midwifery is as important as physical care. Women, wherever they are, want to be treated with respect, kindness, listened to, and involved in making decisions about their care. Recently, it's been reported that some childbearing women have been so harshly treated that it amounts to assault, and that women will avoid going to healthcare institutions because they are treated so unkindly. Sensitive care is not a luxury add-on, it's crucial. Today, in my local National Health Service, midwives are going to meet parents explain midwifery, and each baby will have a card in its crib saying that the baby was born on the inter International Day of the Midwife. This is one way of spreading the word about midwifery. But we need to be realistic about the huge inequalities and the huge problems in the world both between and within countries. The State of the World's Midwifery Report that was published at the Congress of the International Confederation of Midwives last year in South Africa is accessible on the ICM website, and this shows the stark contrast. Focused on 58 countries in which there are 81 million births 58% of the world's births in 2009, but only 17% of the world's midwives, nurses, and physicians. This has 91% of the global burden of maternal mortality, 80% of stillbirths, and 82% of neonatal mortality. In this one world of ours, there are many different worlds, the division isn't simply between developed and developing worlds, because within countries, outcomes between different populations, wealthy and poor, different ethnic groups, are different. Actually, poverty is one of the biggest risk factors. And particularly in the emerging economies, there may be a majority of women who do not have enough care, but a group of women who have an extremely high cesarean section rate those of you listening may be able to talk about this in more detail and from experience. One of the concerns that we might want to share is the lack of global justice in these huge inequalities. There may be developments, but often they bypass the disadvantaged, those who need them the most. This sense of justice I think needs to underlie all of the midwifery development that we think about on this very important day. I was driving to work the other day 
um, through beautiful lanes, and it's springtime here. It's cold and grey, but the flowers are out and the birds are singing. And I was listening to, to the news. There had been bombings in Afghanistan. And I had just read a Royal College of Midwives report that maternal mortality had been reduced through the training and placement of midwives. If you look at the figures here, you'll see that in Afghanistan, they had one of the highest maternal mortalities, much of this related to disruption and war, 1,600 per 100,000 births. Yet this rate had been brought down by the introduction of well-trained midwives. And I couldn't help but think, as I heard about these awful bombings, what effect these setbacks would have. We hear a lot about the casualties of war and disaster. Indeed, every day, every newscast, we hear about soldiers and civilians killed. What doesn't get broadcast is the toll on maternity services on maternity care, of the loss of infrastructure, taking the lives of mother and their babies, of mothers and babies. The earthquake in Haiti increased problems in a country that already had one of the highest maternal mortality rates in the region, 630 per 100,000 births, despite an outpouring of aid. Famine too will take its toll on the invisible ones the pregnant and breastfeeding women and mothers. We should remember, too, that it's estimated that 48 million women around the world give birth without someone attending who has recognized midwifery skills. There is often no or little access to health care facilities or medical aid. But in much of the developed world, there is a different problem. The excess of medical and surgical invention that uses resources disproportionately, but more importantly, poses a health risk to mothers and babies. The cesarean section rate in the United Kingdom is 25%, and it's estimated the normal birth rate is just over 40%. And this is far from the highest cesarean section rate in the world. In China, 46% of women give birth by cesarean section. In the United States of America, and all of you here in the room with me will put me right if I'm wrong, the rate has risen to 34%, one in three babies. There's a growing risk, there's a growing awareness of the risk of cesarean section to mother and baby. Some of the research is difficult to interpret and shows in conflicting results, but evidence indicates that there is an increased maternal and neonatal mortality and morbidity, a risk for future pregnancies, and an increase in stillbirth in subsequent pregnancies after cesarean section, and that is even in groups of women who don't have medical complications. The World Health Organization says that the best outcomes are with a cesarean section rate of between 5 to 10 percent. Rates above 15 percent do more harm than good. Where the cesarean section rate is this high, unless there are real efforts to reduce it, the rate is bound to rise. This leaves those women choosing normal birth in the mi minority. We're not able to measure the evolutionary effects of a high cesarean section rate. Many people now are talking about the effect on epigenetics and the possibility that we might be switching off genes for future generations that will make normal birth more difficult. And we are, of course, needed, needing to consider the loss of the neurohormonal cascade that is so important to mother-baby relationships, particularly oxytocin. Our main emphasis, I think, should be to help first-time mothers avoid cesarean section because they're starting out on their mothering lives. And once you've had one cesarean section, you're more likely to need another.
Home birth, out-of-hospital birth and midwifery-led care are safe options for the baby, and they've got considerable advantages for the mother. They're associated with a lower intervention rate and a higher quality of experience. At present, in the United Kingdom, we have considerable development in midwifery-led care, but the home birth rate is only 3%. But it's higher where there is strong midwifery leadership, and the rate varies a great deal from place to place. I believe, as does the Royal College of Midwives, that midwifery-led care should be the default option for women, rather than going by default into medical or consultant-led care. We've got very supportive government policy for midwifery-led care and a choice of place of birth. Sometimes it can be difficult to change in practice. We really need strong midwifery leadership in this area. A particular interest and passion of mine is continuity of care, having the woman and her midwife getting to know each other over time forming a relationship of trust. This improves the quality and safety of care. I know that there's considerable work going on in this area in Australia, and I look forward to learning more about it when I visit at the end of the year. I can't finish without saying what an example of development of midwifery New Zealand is. I reviewed the book by Sally Pearman and Carrie Gilliland, Women's Business, about the New Zealand College of Midwives. It was such a good read and helped understand how transformation of an entire country had been created. Similarly, in many parts of Canada, which is my other home, there are examples of the best models of practice. What we see is that the linchpin, the heart, the essence of midwifery, is the relationship between midwife and mother the midwife working with a woman in a positive relationship, doing the best for her by up-to-date skills, use of evidence in practice, and understanding her life and life situation. There are some parts of the world where healthy choices are made unavailable, sometimes for extreme measures. One of the examples that comes to mind is the criminalization of home birth in Hungary, and many of you will know about Agnes Greb, who was imprisoned for attending home birth, although she was a qualified obstetrician and midwife, and she's still under house arrest and is seeking pardon from the president. We need a balance. We need a balance between safety and humanization. We need to have, thank you, somebody's putting my slide right, I think. <laughs> women, need access to, <laughs> women need access to midwifery-led care. They need access to medical care also because we need a particular level of cesarean section. There should be access to cesarean section. Women around the world need access to facilities, and they also need access to out-of-hospital birth. But through all of this, there should be respectful, sensitive care. I think I have an empty slide here. The phrase that the ICM is putting out for this International Day of the Midwife is the world needs midwives now more than ever. I think it needs midwives who can practice to the full extent of their power, midwives who are skilled, midwives who are knowledgeable, who can work in relationship with, in and of the community women live in, able to lead and inspire change who can do the politics of improving care, who can do research and write and teach and influence governments, who can use social media, who can be out in the world talking about midwifery. We should always remember that the birth of the baby is the birth of the mother. 
the kind of birth that the baby has will actually influence the way the mother baby, the way the mother babies, <laughs> the way that the mother cares for the baby. Thank you for listening, my dear colleagues. I think we're all going to build a safer world. We're going to build safer care and a better world for mothers and babies. I salute you all, and I'm very happy to take any questions. And above all, very happy International Day of the Midwife. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. Um, I couldn't think of anyone better to open um, this conference because you were able to give us such a wonderful global view, but at the same time um, pull together the strands of the things that hold us all together. Um, thank you so much. Um, I think that there are lots of people that um, do have questions and um, perhaps if we invite you one by one, starting with Susan 1. Um, just reminding you that if your microphone is muted, you'll need to um, unmute your microphone to be able to speak. So Susan, did you have a question? Okay, we might move on to um, Linda. Are you able to talk, um, Linda Wiley? Okay, any, anybody else have, have a question? Um, just speak or raise your, your hand. Um, Denise Hind. I'm not sure how this is working. Um, I was wondering if Leslie has any suggestions about anything else we can do for Agnes and um, midwives in similar situations. and. Being an Australian in New Zealand, I'm very concerned for my colleagues in Australia as well. I'm not sure if you. I thought I had done that. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, there's a lot that you can do. Uh, there are a number of websites about Agnes, and they're wanting midwifery associations in particular to write to the president of Hungary to ask for for clemency for Agnes. She's under um, house arrest at the moment and is due to go back into prison. And many people believe that physically she wouldn't survive. Um, prison in Hungary is very, very harsh indeed. There are a number of questions about her trial because the experts that were called weren't midwives. They were doctors who'd never practiced outside in the community. And one of the... Um, things that the Royal College of Midwives and others are saying is that there should be proper regulation of midwifery and when things go wrong there should be a board of midwives who assesses fitness to practice. It shouldn't go through the criminal justice system. But Agnes is just the tip of the iceberg. There are a number of midwives in East Europe who are going through similar situations. I don't mean to say Agnes is the tip of the iceberg. That sounds really inhuman. Um, but she isn't the only example. She's not the only midwife who's going through this. There are midwives in Eastern Europe 
who are having similar, similar difficulties. I wonder, um, sorry. Um, the International Confederation of Midwives, would, do they have a, a page or something about midwives who are being prosecuted so that we can all act? Well, I, I understand. Um, I work closely with Frances Day Sturt. She's actually one of the directors in the Royal College of Midwives, and she's president of ICM. And ICM apparently will um, help a country set up a structure but they won't interfere or they won't become involved in individual, in individual cases. And I think it's probably up to midwifery associations to do what they can. I see that somebody's put up the link. Thank you very much indeed. But I should emphasize that um, Agnes isn't the only person, and there is a huge issue, I think, about the extreme measures that will be gone to to stop access to home birth. Leslie, I wonder what your reflections of that are, because um, as people have pointed out, you know, um, it's getting worse in many parts of the world. And 20 years ago, when I had my daughter at home, I never would have imagined that it would be harder to access a home birth 20 years later. Um, and the Netherlands, I know, are, are struggling, and they've been, you know, the leading light in this area. Um, but the, the UK seems to. Um, from, from the literature, not you know, being in the country, seems to have held on to that home birth option. I wonder what your reflections are about this whole movement, this anti-home birth movement, and the UK's position. Well, the UK official position, the government policy, is that women should have a choice of where they give birth to their babies. Um, but there is, I think a need to change the culture. And I know that we've got real problems, and I'm aware of what's going on in Holland. And I'm aware that people will interpret the evidence on home birth differently. But I actually think that we're on the edge of a shift. And this shift is going to take midwives, both individual midwives, doing what they can to alter the perception of birth and what healthy birth is, but also groups of midwives. And one of the interesting things that's happening is an awareness, a growing awareness and oh, understanding of the importance of physiological birth. And so I think that there might be a shift in the paradigm. So I think um, we. And I don't want people to feel despondent because each individual can make a difference. And even if you're working in a maternity service where you're very restricted, actually in your individual interaction with women, you can make a difference. But I think what we're looking for is really strong leadership in midwifery. And a lot of this will be in the ability to interpret evidence, to put the evidence out there so that women and, and governments understand it, to show that out-of-hospital birth for women who don't have complications can be the best choice if that's what the woman wants. I like um, the comment so about giving, giving women um, their power and women owning the birth. It's just that we do have to change governments, and we do have to change through organizations without, I think, without that solidarity, the ability to unite. Um, it's very difficult to change. Someone raised um, the issue of the Birthplace UK study. Um, and what sort of impact is that having, Leslie, in the UK? Um, the, 
Well, first of all, um, the main message about the birthplace study is that midwifery-led care is safe. And that is hugely important. And many of you will know that the birthplace study says that for women who've had one baby already or have had babies before, to give birth at home is as safe for the baby as giving birth in hospital. And for the mother, it has considerable advantages because the intervention rate is lower. The problematic part of the birthplace study is that it indicated that there, were, there was a greater incidence of adverse outcomes where first-time mothers had their babies at home for the baby. And I, can't, I don't have time to go into the intricacies, but basically what they did was bring together a number of adverse outcomes to make the study powerful enough. And that, I think, has created quite a few difficulties for us. Um, but I see women who are thinking about where to have their babies. And the main thing we have to remember is that the birthplace study starts with the assertion that generally birth is very safe. And actually, there might be a very slightly increased risk for the baby where mothers are having their first babies at home. I'm not absolutely convinced about this. We need to look at why that is. And we need to hold it in context, because the differences aren't huge. And it's a kind of small, it's a kind of risk that we think about every day in our daily lives and when we're looking after our children. And also, I always emphasize the risks of giving birth in hospital. A colleague of mine says to women when they're choosing where to give birth, if you walk into hospital, you have a 25% chance of having a cesarean section. So I think we need to be turning the world on its head and talking to women about how we can help them avoid cesarean sections if they, if they don't need one how we can help them have a physiological birth, and to consider really seriously having their baby out of hospital. The um, birthplace study did, of course, look at midwifery-led units, both out of hospital and in hospital. And my fear is that it will actually give impetus to, to developing birth centers within hospital. And I think the most powerful care can be found in birth centers out of hospital. Thank you, um, Leslie. I think um, we'll wrap it up there so that we can get ready for the next presentation. But um, I want to thank you so much. As I said before, I think I couldn't think of a better person to um, have the first presentation in this conference. And um, it, it was wonderful. And I love the, the text um, with people being able to comment and, and the immediacy of um, that. So people put up links to the, the article um, that we were referring to and the support groups and, and whatnot in that um, text section. So it's just been wonderful and, and thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, just to remind you that the recordings of these